Thank you, and thanks, um, Aarons and Jackie, for wonderful presentations. Um, I'm going to follow up on uh, what Jackie, um, the argument that Jackie made that uh, for neuroscience, to understand neuroscience, we need to understand complex behavior, and that maybe economics can help us do that. Um, and as neuroscientists, we are interested not just in average uh, behavior and neural mechanisms across the population, but also in individual differences. Um, and we're interested in individual differences of reasons, including the potential relationship between these differences in psychiatric symptoms. So how do we capture uh, individual differences in behavior? One way to do it is to use self-report questionnaires. And there are many, many such questionnaires that are used a lot in neuroscience and psychiatric research. Um, and let me just show you a few examples of questions. So for example, how likely are you to invest 10% of your annual income in a moderate growth mutual fund? Very likely, not so likely, very unlikely, I'll never do that. Um, true or false about yourself? When you get something that you want, you feel excited and energized. No, very true, not true nor false, very false. Um, how frequently do you plan tasks carefully? Never, occasionally, often, almost always. Um, and so these are just a few uh, very widely used questions. There are hundreds of questionnaires like that, and there's a lot of information that we learn from using um, such questionnaires. Uh, but they're also limited. Uh, one limitation is that what we um, think uh, and say about ourselves is not always what we actually do. Uh, but another limitation is that as neuroscientists, we really want some task, some process that participants can be engaged in, that they can actually reveal processes that they use while behaving in the real world. And we want to be able to measure, to record brain activation while participants are actively engaged in these processes. For example, when they're lying in an MRI um, scanner. Uh, and there are several tasks that have been traditionally used. One of the most widely used um, tasks in psychiatric uh, research is the Iowa gambling task, developed by Antoine Bachara and colleagues. Um, and just to briefly describe the task, um, participants see four decks of cards. Um, and on each round of the experiment, they need to um, turn one card, I mean, they need to select one deck and to turn uh, one card, and then they either uh, get a reward, a monetary reward, or they lose money. And the thing is that there are two, two decks um, in which the rewards are large, but every now and then there is a huge loss, such that in the long run there is a net loss. The two other uh, decks have more moderate, more modest rewards, but also smaller punishments, such that in the long run, people actually make money. There is a net gain. And healthy individuals learn by trial and error. So they sample, they get the, the feedback, they get the outcome, and they learn to limit their choices to the good decks. And interestingly, um, actually, even if you measure sweat responses, which, is, which are an indication for uh, arousal level, healthy individuals show increased arousal level for the bad DAX even before they're consciously aware of what is good and what is bad. Individuals with lesions to the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, the same value-related area that Ernst mentioned, uh, are often impaired in um, this task. A lot of other patients are also impaired, so there's many, there have been many studies about that. So, for example, individuals with schizophrenia, substance and alcohol dependency, um, eating disorders. So what this says is that the Iowa gambling task is very, very powerful and robust in showing some different, in showing that there is some different, some, something is, is, is wrong or, or uh, varied um, in a lot of populations. But what exactly is different, that's difficult to say using this task. Because even though it's a simple task, it's actually composed of many processes, right? So we have to learn from feedback, both positive and negative. We apply our individual attitudes towards uncertainty. 
there is uncertainty, there is risk, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, we apply our attitudes to weighting gains and losses. There might be some combination of these uh, factors that differentiate different individuals. So this is where behavioral economics might be of help because um, economics provides us with some very useful constructs that enable us to deconstruct complex behavior into basic processes, cognitive, emotional, motivational processes. And we can use the revealed preference approach that Ernst mentioned um, to, to, as, as, as a starting point, right? We can have subjects make choices between different options where we change different parameters in their options to try and get at their preferences, to try and get at these um, processes that underlie their complex behavior. And we can do that in an incentive compatible manner, which means that we can uh, pay our subjects or give them outcomes based on their choices to encourage them to uh, be truthful, to behave as if they would behave in the real world. And one construct that is very useful that comes from economics and I think already shows promise in neuroscience and psychiatry is the idea that there are different types of uncertainty. A very simple form of uncertainty is risk, which is when you know the probabilities for different outcomes of your actions. So for example, when we toss a coin, we know that it's 50-50 for heads or tails. But in most real life behavior, these outcomes are not given to us. We don't know the precise probabilities for different outcomes, right? There is at least some ambiguity, this is what economists call it, some ambiguity around outcome probabilities. So, you know, whether you start a new project at work or you meet a new person or even a mundane choice like um, ordering a course uh, in the restaurant, right? You know that there is some chance for this um, item to be tasty, not tasty, uh, but you don't know any precise probabilities for these different potential outcomes. And we can measure individual risk and ambiguity attitudes in the laboratory by having subjects make choices. So we can have them choose between risky um, and certain option for options, for example, to get their risk attitudes. In this case, for example, this is a lottery with 50-50 chance of getting either $10 or zero. And the choice can be between playing this lottery and getting $5 for sure. So someone who's risk averse would go for the $5. Someone who's maybe risk seeking can go for the lottery. Um, and we can change choices by paying subjects more money for the lottery. You can make the risk averse person choose the lottery as well. At some point, everybody will switch to the lottery, right? Um, so we can have subjects make many, many such choices and characterize their behavior under risk. We can do the same thing with ambiguity. We can hide some of the information about outcome probabilities, like here, we know that there is at least 25% chance for $10, at least 25% chance for nothing, but then what's here, it's occluded. So we don't know what the probabilities are. And someone who is very averse of ambiguity might feel like, oh, this is probably all red because I know that nature and God and whatever is always against me. So that's probably a very small probability for $10, so I'll go for the $5. Whereas someone who's more ambiguity seeking or not affected so much by ambiguity might um, choose the lottery. And interestingly, there is a lot of research that shows that there is very little correlation between individual attitudes towards risk and ambiguity. So a person might be highly risk averse, not so averse to ambiguity, and vice versa, or any combination. So if we're interested in understanding individual differences, it's important uh, and can be potentially useful to look at both risk and ambiguity attitudes in different individuals. So do we see any evidence of these contracts, constructs in the brain? There is some evidence. Uh, this is um, a functional MRI study from a, a number of years ago from Scott Hotel, showing that a region in the prefrontal cortex, activity in this region is correlated with individual ambiguity attitudes, but not with individual risk attitudes. Conversely, 
an area in posterior parietal cortex at the back of the head, activity there is correlated with risk attitudes but not ambiguity attitudes. So some indication for such a differentiation between risk and ambiguity in the brain. Moreover, at least for risk, we now have some evidence that brain structure predicts individual risk attitudes. Um, so the volume of gray matter in particular areas of the brain actually predict risk attitudes. People with more gray matter volume are more tolerant towards risk or less risk averse suggesting that this idea of risk attitude that comes from economics is actually something fundamental, kind of a personality trait that uh, we can see by looking at the structure of the brain even when subjects are not engaged in any task. So what happens in psychiatric research? There is some evidence that these constructs are helpful there as well. Uh, so, for example, this is a study about um, participants with generalized anxiety, and these participants show increased risk aversion compared to um, healthy individuals. Conversely, in post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, psychopathology that develops as a uh, result of experiencing trauma, there is actually no difference between patients and healthy controls in their risk attitudes. There is difference, however, in their ambiguity attitudes. And this difference seems to be, at least from um, some research that we've done, seems to be specific to the loss domain. So if you um, choose between, let's say, $5 for sure and some unknown chance of more than $5, there is no difference between patients and, and controls. But if the choice is between losing $5 for sure and taking some unknown chance of losing more than $5, healthy individuals not so averse to ambiguity, individuals with PTSD are significantly so. So increased risk aversion in anxiety, increased aversion to ambiguous losses in PTSD. Another disorder, antisocial personality disorder, these individuals actually show reduced aversion to ambiguity. And interestingly, one thing that you can see here is this continuous association between ambiguity aversion and symptoms. These are symptoms in questionnaires used to measure antisocial behavior. And what you can see is that the more severe symptoms are associated with lower ambiguity aversion. And this is, um, uh, th this approach is consistent with uh, where the psychiatric research is moving towards now, which is um, moving away from the uh, categorical definitions of psychiatric disorders towards a more um, continuous uh, examination of, of symptoms and uh, cognitive and emotional constructs that might underlie these symptoms. So the DSM uh, definitions are to some extent, um, arbitrary. So, you know, schizophrenia, bipolar, depression, PTSD, and so on. On the one hand, there are many different combinations of symptoms that can lead to the same diagnosis. I think in the case of PTSD, it's more than 100,000 different combinations. On the other hand, there is a lot of comorbid comorbidity, a lot of overlap between symptoms of different disorders, suggesting that psychopathology is dimensional and transdiagnostic in nature. So if we are able to identify um, constructs, uh, processes that may underlie psychopathology symptoms, it might take us beyond this arbitrary categorization and really um, give us some handle on the basic processes that are different in psychopathology. And so today we already have some evidence for association between clinical symptoms and economic constructs. We al also have some evidence for association between economic constructs and neurobiological markers. And we know something about the associations between clinical symptoms and uh, the neurobiological systems that um, are associated with these symptoms. So I think a challenge and a big question for the field now is um, to see whether these economic constructs 
can actually explain the associations between clinical symptoms and neurobiological uh, markers, and more importantly, point us to um, uh, new systems, new neurobiological uh, characterizations uh, that might underlie clinical conditions. Thank you.